In this lecture video, I'm going to be discussing the cell envelope, which essentially encapsulates the bacteria. It lies outside of the cytoplasm, which is the liquid sort of gelatinous center of the cell. Um, it's composed of either two or three basic layers, depending on what type of bacteria you are. Uh, all bacteria, well, a majority of bacteria have a cell wall and a cell membrane. If they have a third la layer, they will also have what is called an outer membrane. So we differentiate between these two groups as having two layers or three layers as being gram-positive or gram-negative. And essentially, this is based on how they stain. And this essentially... Uh, divides bacteria into two major classes. There are some that lie out of this, but most of them fall into either gram-positive or gram-negative. Now, a gram stain is something that we'll perform in the lab, and it's named after the guy who invented it, and we can actually stain bacteria different colors based on what kind of uh, cell envelope they have. If you're a gram-positive bacteria, you have two layers, and the two layers that you have are a cell wall and a cell membrane. The cell wall is a layer of peptidoglycan. So I've mentioned that word several times. Peptidoglycan is a polysaccharide that makes up a cell wall. And for gram-positive bacteria, it's a very thick cell wall. And then there's a little space, a little periplasmic space, they call it. And then there's an inner cytoplasmic membrane, which is similar to um, the cytoplasmic membrane that you learn about, the phospholipid bilayer of cell structure in any general biology class. Now, a gram-negative bacteria is one that has three layers. It has an outer membrane, it has a peptidoglycan cell wall, and it has a cytoplasmic membrane. So in this case, you can see the outer membrane is, is green here, and then you have a very thin peptidoglycan layer, and then you have the cytoplasmic membrane, and they are separated by periplasmic spaces. Now, the cell wall uh, determines the shape. It provides structural support and um, allows the, or prevents things from going into and out of the cell very easily. It's a rigid structure. It is a series of polysaccharides. So if you see here, it's a chains of polysaccharides that are connected by these peptide or amino acid bridges that keep it very rigid. And it is a target of many antibiotics. And the reason is, is because it is unique to bacteria. So when we're developing drugs, we're always looking for something that is unique to bacteria that we don't have so that if we, you know, administer the drug, then it's not going to harm us. So I'll be pointing out a lot of things that are specific to bacteria that are potential drug targets. So just a different kind of animation here. You can see that we have a gram positive here and a gram negative. And this image shows well how thick the peptidoglycan layer is preventing movement of things inside and outside of the cell. And you can see that it does have some markers. It has to have some way of communicating with the outside world. So there are some markers that are bound within uh, the peptidoglycan layer. And then you have the cytoplasmic layer here. Or, sorry, excuse me, the cytoplasmic membrane layer. As opposed to here, we see gram-negative. You see the outer membrane layer here. The outer membrane has some pores and some transport areas, which allows things to flow into the cell. But we still have a peptidoglycan layer. It's thinner. Um, and then we have an inner membrane or the cytoplasmic membrane. Now, all bacteria fall into a gram-positive or a gram-negative. There's some that have modified, there's some that have no cell walls. Um, so the uh, couple of groups that have non-typical or no cell walls are mycobacterium and nocardia. And also, archaea have different types of cell walls. And I'm very gener generic about that, because remember what I said about archaea in that we've, you know, recently discovered them within the past, like, 30, 35 years that they even existed. And they're very, very difficult to culture in a lab. We're still developing methods on how to effectively culture them. So they've been very difficult to study in detail. We've been able to find them genetically, but we've, but we've, 
had a lot of trouble growing them in a lab and be able to observe them and stain them and do things like that, which is why we don't know a lot about them at this point. A mycoplasm is a group of bacteria that lacks cell walls entirely. So in order to make up the function of cell wall, you know, that rigid structural support as well as the prevention of movement of things inside of the cell, they have extra sterols that are embedded within their cell membrane to help to stabilize them and make them resistant to the movement of water and therefore lysis, which is cell rupture. And there's a more important medical species, mycoplasma pneumonia, so one cause of, one cause of pneumonia um, that is uh, a result of this mycoplasm group. So the third layer of the gram-negative is the outer membrane, and it's made up of polysaccharides and proteins, like I said, and it's essentially like a phospholipid bilayer. It has um, some, you know, little markers that hang off it that help it to communicate, and it has pores that allow things to go freely into and out of the cell. However, again, we still have this peptidoglycan layer that protects it from just being able to flow in and out. Finally, the third layer that they all have is the cytoplasmic membrane, and this is very similar to what we learned about the phospholipid bilayer in, um, you know, when we learn about eukaryotic cells. So it's a phospholipid bilayer, it regulates transport, it's selectively permeable, it's a fluid mosaic, um, it secretes chemicals outside of the intercellular space. Um, but what's interesting to note about this is that in that membrane is where energy reactions and nutrient processing happens for a microbe. In a eukaryotic cell that has organelles, the uh, energy reactions, which here we're talking about electron transport chain, the formation of ATP, microbial metabolism, or excuse me, metabolism, you know, occurs within the wall of the mitochondria. Whereas in a bacteria, because it doesn't have those, where does that happen? That happens in the cytoplasmic membrane, which is why, also why it's important to have that sort of uh, membrane encapsulated by a cell wall to protect whatever is being formed from just leaving the cell. So th another importance um, with the cell membrane and the cell envelope is how it interacts with humans. So the outer membrane makes it uh, difficult to penetrate um, antimicrobials um, and that makes them more difficult to inhibit and kill. Um, and gram-negative bacteria are typically the ones that are pathogenic. Um, now, the outside cell envelope as a whole also plays an important role medically because it's what helps us to interact, or what helps us, what helps bacteria to interact with human tissues. Now, this could be a positive thing in terms of um, the beneficial bacteria that live within a human, but it can also be a negative thing. It can also be a... a uh, help to cause disease. So the structure and the ex external structures in the cell envelope can be important in pathogenicity or the ability for an organism to be uh, infectious. In the next lecture video, I'm going to move on and I'm going to start talking about specific internal structures of a prokaryote.